The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, stars put on notice to shine up their acts or else they'll be in line for a pink time slip. Boomers and boomies together in a tasty brew of exciting stories. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. We have a roundtable discussion on the great new anthology Star Destroyers this time on the podcast. This one is hosted by Redoubtable Bain Consulting Editor David F. Sharirod, and it includes some excellent writers who you may know best from their great Bain books. We have Robert Butner, Joel Presby, J.R. Dunn, Susan R. Matthews, and Brendan Dubois, along with anthology editors Christopher Rocchio, who also has a story in the book, and yours truly, Tony Daniel, who is one of the editors. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Leaden Universe novel, Alliance of Equals. First, here's the news. One bit of news this time is the startling fact that this podcast marks the fifth anniversary of the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. Woohoo! It's hard to believe we've been at this for five years, coming to you every week with interviews with great writers, artists, and scientists, and we've been through four and a half audiobook serializations. It's been a great run, and we're raring to go with more. Love having you along. Thank you so much for listening. Every time we put one of these together, we try to make it as entertaining and helpful to you, our great listeners, as possible. And I hope you've discovered some amazing books and articles and stories as a result of the podcast. So Ad Astra and onward and upward with the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast listeners as well. Hey, there are new eARCs out now at Bain eBooks. Now eARCs are those little athletic acorns on the oak trees that practice and practice while they're hanging there and actually manage to make it out from the oak tree's penumbra when they fall and thus, you know, being able to germinate. They are so inspirational. Also, that's not true. Actually, eARCs are advanced electronic reading copies of books that we put out. You can read a new book in ebook form that you really want to read early or maybe the next entry in your favorite series, and you will be able to get these sometimes months in advance, usually two to three months in advance. Out now in eARC form is Grantville Gazette 8, edited by Eric Flint and Walt Boyes. Hey, it's the 8th Anthology of Tales set in Eric Flint's phenomenal Ring of Fire universe, all selected and edited by Eric and Walt. The most popular alternate history series of all time continues when an inexplicable cosmic disturbance hurls your town from 20th century West Virginia back to 7th century Europe and into the middle of the Thirty Years' War. You'd better be adaptable to survive. Here's a generous helping of more stories of Grantville, the American town lost in time and its impact on the people and societies of a tumultuous age. This is edited by Eric Flint and Walt Boyes, the editor of the Grantville Gazette magazine, from which the best selections are made for this anthology. The setting has become a political, economic, social, and cultural puzzle, as supporting characters we meet in the novels get their own lives, loves, and life-changing stories. The future and democracy have arrived with a bang, a historic explosion with a multitude of unforeseen consequences. Also out as an e-arc is another great anthology, the Year's Best Military and Adventure SF, Volume 4, edited by David Asharirod, who you will hear momentarily hosting this podcast. The Year's Best Military and Adventure SF series roars into its fourth year with more stories of daring do, military combat, and edge-of-your-seat suspense filled with thrilling tales of grand science fiction adventure and military action. Selected from the top print and digital markets, yes, David reads everything out there and finds the best. These stories are guaranteed to challenge, provoke, and entertain. Plus, you will get to be the judge. We have this interactive reader polling where you can go to our website at Bain.com and vote on the best story. One story from this anthology will be chosen via this proctored online voting for the Best Military and Adventure Science Fiction Reader's Choice Award, which is presented every year at Dragon Con. We're going to do it this year at Dragon Con on Labor Day. So for more information, go to Bain.com and you can find out all about that. Yes, you can start voting even now, as soon as you get the EARC. 
Grantville Gazette 8, edited by Eric Flint and Walt Boys, and The Year's Best Military and Adventure SF Volume 4, edited by David F. Shariarod, are exclusively available at Baney Books, so check them out. Hey everybody, David F. Shirerod, and I am glad to be back in the interviewer's chair here on the Bane Free Radio Hour. Today we're going to be talking about Star Destroyers. It's a new anthology out now in trade paperback from Bane Books, and it is all about big ships blowing things up. Here to talk about it with me are the co-editors of the book, as well as some of the contributors. Let's go ahead and introduce them. First up, the man... The myth, the legend, the podcast host. Mr. Tony Daniel is on the line with us. He is the author of 11 fantasy and science fiction novels, the latest of which is the young adult fantasy, The Amber Arrow. His science fiction books include Guardian of Night, Metaplanetary, Superluminal, Earthling, Warpath, and the two Star Trek original series novels, Devil's Bargain and Savage Trade. With David Drake, he's the author of two entries in the general series from Bane, The Heretic and the Savior. He's also the author of a short story collection called The Robot's Twilight Companion. He is the host of the podcast you're listening to and the co-editor of Star Destroyers. Tony, thanks for talking with us about the book. Sure. Thanks for doing this, David. No problem. Uh, Tony's co-editor is also here, Mr. Christopher Rocchio is the author of The Sun Eater, a space opera series from Daw Books, the first novel of which Empire of Silence will be out later this year. He is assistant editor at Bain Books and a graduate of North Carolina State University, uh, like myself. Go Wolfpack, Christopher. Thanks for uh, thanks for being on. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. All right. We also have Mr. J.R. Dunn. He is the author of the novels This Side of Judgment, Days of Cain, uh, which is wildly hailed as one of the most powerful time travel novels to deal with the Holocaust, and Full Tide of Night. He was the longtime associate editor of the International Military Encyclopedia and is now an editor at The American Thinker. His nonfiction appears regularly on Bain.com. Uh, J.R. Dunn, thank you so much for uh, coming on today. Good evening. Glad to be here. Hi, Joel, Hi, Joel Presby's, Presby's latest, latest novel, novel co-written, co-written with, with David Weber, Weber is, the is The Road to Hell, which continues, which continues the multiverse series. She is a she graduate, is a graduate of, the of the Naval Postgraduate, Postgraduate School, where she studied how to find and kill submarines, submarines and also met a also charming, charming submarine, submarine, submarine officer. officer. During her During military, her military, military career, career, nations with nations significant, with significant submarine fleets stubbornly, stubbornly refused to go to war with the United States. But even though she was neither a war hero nor cannon fodder, she did still get the guy. So happy ending there. Uh, Joel, thanks so much for uh, for coming on the podcast. Susan R. Matthews was raised in a military family and spent her younger years living around the globe. Her debut novel, An Exchange of Hostages, the first entry in her critically acclaimed Under Jurisdiction series, was nominated for the Philip K. Dick Award. She was also a finalist for the John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer. There are now seven novels in the Under Jurisdiction series. The first six are collected in two omnibus editions. Fleet Inquisitor, and Fleet Renegade. The newest entry in the series is Blood Enemies, uh, which is all those are uh, available from Bane Books. Uh, She lives in Seattle with her wife Maggie and two delightful dogs. She is a veteran of the U.S. Army, and she is also an avid ham radio operator. Uh, Susan R. Matthews, thank you so much for coming on and talking about your story. Pleasure mine. All right. Nationally best-selling author Robert Butner was a Quill Award nominee for Best New Writer of 2005, and his debut novel Orphanage, excuse me, Orphanage, uh, Quill nominated as Best SF Fantasy Horror Novel of 2004, has been called a classic of modern military science fiction. His ninth novel, The Golden Gate, is set in the near present, but has a giant spaceship in it, just like his first eight. He was a National Science Foundation Fellow in Paleontology, served as a U.S. Army Intelligence Officer, prospected for minerals in Alaska and the Sonoran Desert, and has been General Counsel of a unit of one of the United States' largest private multinational companies. Uh, Bob Butner, uh, thank you so much for coming on the Bain Free Radio Hour. Thank you very much for having me, David. And last but not least, uh, we have Mr. Brendan Dubois. He is the award-winning author of 21 novels and more than 160 short stories. 
His short stories have thrice won him the Seamus Award from the Private Eye Writers of America and have also earned him three Edgar Award nominations. He has recently collaborated with New York Times bestselling author James Patterson on three novellas for Patterson's Bookshots, as well as on two upcoming novels. Uh, he was a former Jeopardy, champ- excuse me, Jeopardy champion, and he appeared on and won the game show The Chase. For Bain, he writes the uh, Dark Victory series, uh, the third book of which will be coming out, I believe, later this year. Uh, Brendan, thanks for being on the Bain Free Radio Hour again. Hey, it's a delight, as always. All right, well, um, Tony and Christopher, I want to talk to you about the anthology as a whole, but um, J.R. Dunn has a time crunch he's under, so we're going to skip ahead and talk to him first. So, uh, J.R. Dunn, uh, yeah, J.R. Dunn, uh, you wrote a story called Boomers in here. I really like this one. It's an alternate history um, where the space race and the Cold War didn't go exactly like they did in our timeline. And I just wonder um, if you could set up the the setting of your story, Boomers, and how in, in this timeline uh, the Soviets and Americans uh, took the space race a little a little bit differently, a little more to heart maybe than we, we ourselves did. That's true. That's a good way of putting it. The thing is, I always had a fascination with uh, the Orion spacecraft. This was a uh, this is something uh, thought up by Freeman Dyson, uh, Ted Taylor, and a few other people, in which you had a uh, spaceships that were actually propelled by nuclear explosions, which, uh, to my mind, is the coolest thing ever. I mean, you know, you know, top that Gene Roddenberry, right? But. Uh, that they've always fascinated me ever since I've ever since I've uh, I've, I've heard of them, and it's it seemed to me that if if the U.S. and the Soviets were to go that way, had gone that way, it would it would really make for for one hell of a background for a story. And there it is, boomers. Yeah, and so here we um, instead of sort of going to the moon to prove that we could, we we kind of stay, and um, like you mentioned, we have these. Uh, spacecraft that are powered by nuclear explosions. Um, but this also has a, a, a militarization of space that we haven't really to date seen happen in, in reality. Um, and I just wonder, yeah, we've managed to avoid it. And I wonder um, your take after writing this, you know, in the real world, do you see if we do continue as I think most of us on this podcast hope we do um, to explore space is, is the militarization of space inevitable? Um, you've got this great paragraph in here, or it's really two paragraphs, um, where the, the main character is talking about all the wonders of space that are out there that we to explore. Um, but he says, but all that had to wait. No hurry, they'd still be out there. They'd keep, we have to do some killing first, Strode thought. Once that was done, maybe we'll have time to look. And that paragraph really struck me. Um, and I wondered if you could talk about that and how that informed this story that you were writing. Well, I think the militarization of space is inevitable to a certain extent because you're going to need uh, you're going to need protection, you're going to need outposts, you're going to need uh, people out there that are that are that are willing to uh, take up the defense. But I, I certainly don't hope it ever gets to the point that it got in boomers. I was figuring from that from there that it would, it's uh, this this whole thing starts just after the Cuban Missile Crisis and uh, the which is the height of the Cold War, but the uh, the balance of terror. Both sides are, are pointing nuclear weapons at each other, and and, and it's, it just naturally moves out into space as a kind of an evolutionary sort of thing. Now, we, we, it didn't happen, and we're damn lucky it didn't happen, it, 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 that it did. I don't see it's gonna, that it's going to happen from uh, from here on in because at this point, we're, we don't have the governments really all that interested in space anymore. It's being handed over to the to private entrepreneurs, you know, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos. Branson and so forth, and, it, and that's a good thing. You know, it, it's, it's always struck me as an irony that people used to mock uh, Robert Heinlein for uh, writing uh, *The Man Who Sold the Moon*, which was about an, an entrepreneur going to the moon. Okay, people sneered at him for years. Oh no, it's the government that's going to do it. We need research teams. We need billions of dollars. And we tried that. It didn't work. All we've got is a cute little space station that nobody does much at. Now it's being taken by the by the entrepreneurs, and uh, I hope we'll see a hell of a lot of results. On the other hand, I don't think that the that these these guys are are pretty much a hip, sophisticated uh, 21st century bunch, and I don't think they're going to be too all that interested in militarization. Interesting, um, Tony or Christopher, you guys edited this. I'm sure um, 
it was fun to see this one come across the the transom although obviously it was not a slush pile you solicited all the um did you have anything you wanted to add about the story or, or maybe ask jr dunn um to expound on but what is the um i mean part of the fun of the story is that there is um there's this sort of hidden cuckoo uh thing that's going to uh to kill us all if we don't take care of it um and it, it seems like there's there's some of that still left over from the real Cold War that comes back. Um, well, yeah, certainly. I mean, look, look at Putin. He's gas. He's he's a nerve gassing people in uh, in uh, the UK. This this is more or less exactly what Stalin was doing back in the twenties and thirties. A lot of people. Well, that's that that ties into another thing is that the entire Cold War period, the entire rivalry between the West and the Communist East, is pretty much going down the memory hole. You ask the, uh, the 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 millennial kids uh, to tell you about the, about the Cold War, and they know two things: they know Vietnam, and they they know Joe McCarthy. Everything else is just is just a vague kind of blur. And it's one thing I wanted to deal with this story too. I wanted to uh, wanted to come across with the, with the, with the with the notion that hey, we were real lucky that we won. And it's yeah, a damn I mean, good a thing us, that the West won. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. People that are your and my age remember when we were under threat of destruction. <laughs> I remember back to of the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I remember yeah, that. The I'm old enough for that. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's so one thing I wanted to deal millennium. with. And I also intend to deal with it in the in the in the outline I'm working for you, which I will get to you sometime before the end of the millennium. It's uh, it, it's, <laughs> it's something that's being forgotten, and uh, and 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 it damn well shouldn't be forgotten. As you know, there's the there's the quote from. Uh, um, uh, Santiago that everybody knows is, is not even worth repeating about the well, people who forget history. And with the, was one thing that we don't want, and this goes back to, to, to the question that Dave was asking just a minute ago, we don't want to repeat the Cold War with 21st century weaponry. I don't think that's on anybody's agenda. Well, maybe Putin's yeah, agenda, man. I don't know. Maybe Putin's. <laughs> I think Christopher might have wanted to jump, to jump in and defend oh, millennials. Well, I was just going to like say, speaking on behalf of millennials. <laughs> well, I'm not talking about the average uh, millennial. I'm not talking about educated yeah, millennials. There, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> a lot of them don't know nothing. A lot of, a lot of you ask, it, it's like, you know, uh, it's, it's like you ask oh. what happened a week before they were born. They have no idea. Oh, no, I've made a hobby out of explaining, out of explaining that to a bunch of my uh, contemporaries. I, I was... I, I was trying to make a joke, but the timing's moved on. <laughs> um, well, uh, J.R. Dunn, I know you said you needed to go, so um, I think we'll leave it at that. I really enjoyed the story and um, and the the world you created, and I think, uh, in a way, like you said, it you don't want to make it sound like it's preachy or teaching a lesson, but it, it does that while also, you know, a bit, you know, things blowing well, I'm glad up. You said that because because that, that's what I try to do. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. thanks to everybody, and have fun, and thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> All right, um, Tony Tony, and Christopher, um, let's talk about the book a little bit overall, and then we'll jump back in with some of the more, one of the stories. When I introduced everyone, um, you may have noticed a theme, uh, and that is that everyone has a connection to Bane, uh, besides just being in this one anthology. And that's true of everyone in the anthology. Uh, this is really a Bane kind of family affair. And since we're on the Bane Free Radio Hour, we can talk about that. Um, Tony or Christopher, either one of you want to talk about um, how you selected people uh, to be in this, to ask for stories for this thing? Well, I mean, my thought from the beginning was that um, we wanted to do a Bane anthology, a Bane centric anthology with Bane writers that everybody had some connection with Bane, um, if possible. Although we wouldn't, es- you know, eschew asking others, uh, and we and we did with Dave Barra, for instance. Uh, but uh, and the subject matter would be something that I knew that Bane readers would would love, which is big ships blowing things up, which is. Uh, uh, you know, a cute way, a, a high concept way of talking about the idea that um, a large, the, uh, the battleship, the 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 melding of humans and and machinery that is this um, sort of a fighting or 
exploring craft that um, has has been part of our sort of archetypical heritage since uh, since sailing days um, and the, the era of discovery. So that was that was sort of the concept um, that I took to Tony, and then we um, developed it from that, me and Christopher, and it has become. Uh, I think a, a wonderful anthology with some really completely different takes on the same thing, um, and that are wonderful uh, variations on on uh, on this theme. Yeah, and another thing that's worth noting too is that the the concept sort of underwent a metamorphosis fairly early on. We were thinking. Originally, we were going to call the, uh, the the anthology Boomers, which is, of course, the name of Jeff Dunn's story, and it was going to have a bit more of a, a submarine feel all the way through. And if you read through the anthology, I think we've got is it three submarine stories that are uh, you know extra solar submarines. I know Jody Lanai has had one, and uh, oh gosh, I can't remember who had the other couple. Um, well, I definitely tried the submarine it, story. Yeah. Of course, Joel's was a uh, submarine story in, in yeah, uh, in spirit. <laughs> but we actually had some that were actually underwater. But in any case, um, and so if you, you know, you're looking through the story, there uh, the anthology as a whole, there are some stories that are underwater in space and some that are in space in space. And so... Uh, to glance at it, it, that might seem like a strange twist, but it's it's because of this sort of concept shift that happened fairly early on in the the whole yeah, editorial process. It's also the the analogy between submarines and spacecraft is, I mean, is a pretty close uh, one to one okay. thing. And I think, uh, yeah, I mean, who knows what what spacecraft uh, will be like, but one can imagine that um, they'll be enclosed. <laughs> well, it definitely won't be dog fighting with x wings that's for sure. Yeah. So, uh, and, and I just, uh, I'm so happy to have all these, these paid writers respond because I, I'll, we put out anthologies um, a good bit, more than a lot of other publishers. So a lot of our anthologies have one or two or three main writers in them. I wanted one that um, allowed everybody that I all these great writers a chance to, to write a short story um, because I don't, you know, a lot of times novelists don't get asked to write short stories because people think of them as book writers and, and they're really good at it. And uh, I think these, these people proved it with, uh, with this great anthology. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's talk about one of these uh, great stories that feels like it's on a submarine sort of, uh, which is uh, try not to kill us all by Joel Presby. Um, we mentioned in your bio that you um, have a background working with submarines and you're married to a submarine officer. Um, so this was, I would say in many ways, I would think, think, think right up your alley. Um, how did having that background, um, I affect the world building and the writing of, of uh, Try Not to Kill Us All. Well, when I got the email from Tony and Christopher inviting me to contribute, I at first thought that they might have created the entire anthology just for me, and I was wondering whether or not anyone else would be able to try to people's arms into being willing to write something that was so interesting for me to write. So I'm, I'm grateful that the anthology existed and I got to contribute. Um, I guess the way it impacted my world building was I had a ton of material and I had to pare it down to what would be understandable for someone who hadn't gotten a master's degree in anti-submarine warfare and to make it accessible and hopefully fun to read. Yeah, it's funny that you say that it could be a situation where you almost knew too much uh, and yet had to pare it down. Um, I love this story, though, and I love the central conceit of this with the um, basically there's aliens and they have this trash that degrades into this substance that is very valuable to humanity and we've got to go uh, get it. Um, so I just wanted you to set that up for the readers because I think it's such a great hook. Um, and this great little bit of world building. So, I mean, I guess it's called Shinerite. Um, so 
what is it? Why do we want it? And how do we get it? Yeah. I, I wanted to, I wanted to get to write submarines in space and I needed a reason for ships to be acting like submarines for them to be doing what in the ocean uh, is called target motion analysis, where you have trouble knowing exactly where something is uh, because of the way the properties of water are. But space is nothing like water. So I needed something else. And I came up with this idea that there are super powerful aliens out there who make stuff and then move on and they have their whatever they make decomposed into some manner of nanotech that we don't completely as humans understand, even in the far future, but we're able to use it and make energy sources and things with it that we can't make from any stuff that we can create on our own, that this is a a source of energy and power and tech as we're trying to a little bit retcon what the aliens have. But the aliens aren't communicating with us directly. They're not giving us this stuff. They don't really want us to have it. They have created these little space Roombas that are going around and cleaning up after them. And the things are designed to go find that leftover Shinerite and demolish it. And they will accidentally demolish planets or ships or space stations that that get in the way. And so we have to send our spaceships out and sneakily grab it because we're human and we're not willing to just let this wonderful thing go. Yeah, and so um, re- yeah, so readers can probably extrapolate from there that this is about a mission to do that, and um, it's pretty edge of your seat. I am also really like the tension. I don't know if, how much we can talk about this, but... Um, the main character, Al- Albro, and his he's working for a new commanding officer. And I thought that was interesting, that the, the different, how he viewed him and the level of respect and stuff like that. I don't know if there's something about that you had to say, or maybe not. Maybe maybe I've said it, but... <laughs> other navies and other times and other nations, navies in modern times all have different cultures, but in the United States Navy, there's a common theme where the enlisted force make everything happen, but the officer corps is following all these policies and organizing and in charge of the war fighting. So the most senior people in the enlisted force, the the chief mess, the chief senior chiefs and master chiefs, are sometimes at odds with the officers, especially the more senior, the the ship's commanding officer, because the chiefs are getting things done and the officers are kind of getting in the way and causing problems. And so I got to play a little bit with that conflict and I I had fun with it. Yeah. I think it worked out well. Um, Tony or Christopher, anything you guys had about um, trying not to kill us all? (laughs) I just thought it was an incredibly cool idea for unobtainium. That one that I haven't seen before. (laughs) The, uh, <laughs> and those those Roombas will follow you anywhere, everywhere. And it doesn't matter how much you disperse the stuff, they will come and destroy it. So you, you really can't get caught by them. Yeah. Um, well, let's, um, let's go. And Christopher and Les, did you have anything or no? Um, well, I mean, I, I Tony mentioned this with the Roombas. I, the, the enemies were just implacable, which is always fun, you know, to give this good sense of suspense and it's yeah and it's interesting because we're we're not really directly fighting the aliens in this right we're um sort of sneaking around it's kind of it's cool it's a really cool little cool concept to work with um let's let's just go down the table of contents uh and we'll go to we'll skip to skipjack um actually i think it's the next one in the book so we're not skipping anything but um so let's go to skipjack by susan r matthews Um, this is, this is, I was talking to Tony Daniel today about this podcast and I said, I love doing these because I love short stories, but it's always tough to talk about short stories without giving something away because they're not novels. They're short. Um, so 
Um, I, I don't even know what to ask you. Is this, we mentioned your Under Jurisdiction series. Is this set in that series? or And if so, how does that fit in? Or is this a wholly new creation for you? Well, you know, um, I didn't write it Under Jurisdiction. So uh, it uh, this particular story has got um, nothing to do with the main storyline uh, of uh, any anything that a person has read, if a person has read of the under-jurisdiction novels or associated short stories um, that uh, Bain has published or reprinted. Um, given the fact that uh, the jurisdiction uh, universe, the way it's set up, is, uh, encompasses uh, multiple different worlds at different levels of organization, and some of them have made first contact and some of them haven't, you know, you know, you could, you could wave your hands and say, oh, well, you know, this is just kind of like under jurisdiction except for it's off there in the corner and nobody in jurisdiction knows it's there anymore and it doesn't have anything to do with jurisdiction. And then, you know, the logical, logical thing to say is in that case, it really doesn't belong to the universe, does it? So <laughs> it was conceived of as a standalone uh, with uh, – with not much to, of anything to do with the with my uh, my my magnum opus, as it were, so to speak. Um, Skipjack uh, is uh, set in the kind of an environment. It's got to be a relatively small system um, because uh, this culture has not um, developed any hand waving scientific wink wink nudge nudge equivalent of a faster than light drive. Um, so it's small enough that people can get from A to B at sublight speed. Um, and you have a polity, you have, you have different worlds or different peoples with a common cultural background, but they have spread out and inhabited more than one planet uh, within the same relatively small system and uh, fallen to conflict over how things are to be run and who is to run them. Um, and so the conflicts escalated within uh, recent generations into armed conflict. Uh, they've been engaged in a hot war and a cold war back and forth for probably about 150 years at this point. And at the point at which the story Skipjack takes place, it's pretty much understood by everybody involved that they're getting to the end of a period of hot war. Um, and one side is losing and the other side isn't. Um, they're pretty evenly matched, all right. But uh, um, the uh, people who won the first time around, the people who are winning again, they're going to try much harder this time to make sure that the people who lost um, stay down. And uh, and don't um, don't come knocking at the door anymore ever again with any ideas about uh, political autonomy. Um, I particularly like the protagonist in this story because uh, they can't they can't both come out on the winning side. But the protagonist is is a guy that kind of had a crush on the skipjack commerce raiders when he was a boy, and so it's a little bit poignant for him to be at the end of the war again and to see this. Old, tired, beat up, battled, run down, breaking apart, skipjack, coming into his uh, ship trap uh, at the beginning of the story. I like that you can tell that you are used to writing these big epic, mag like you said, magnum opus, because of all the background work you put into this standalone short story, that's great. Um, uh, I guess I don't want to give away too much of it, but... Um, do you want to talk about what Haberite is and Happy Gas um, a little bit, maybe? Or do you want to leave that for the reader to discover on his or her own? It's hard for me to really uh, say much about those things uh, yeah. without uh, getting too involved with the story. Now, Happy yeah. Gas hey, is kind of kind of easy. Happy Gas is just something that happens when you're when the propulsion systems in an old skipjack class uh, commerce raider start to go. When the propulsion systems start to uh, start to die, in effect, they can't be properly maintained any, lo any longer. Then uh, a variety of uh, uh, chemical byproducts, uh, gases that should be contained in the process and, and aren't anymore, will start to leak into your atmosphere. And when I was thinking about happy gas, I was happy gas. I was really thinking of nitrous oxide. 
So you've got the kind of situation where your propulsion is dying. Uh, it's still working, but it's clearly on the way out. And while it's doing that, it's begun to really throw a whole bunch of industrial contaminants into the air. And one of them makes people kind of drunk and silly, and uh, uh, they, they they lose their uh, train of thoughts a lot. Uh, they lose their concentration. They just the whole thing just kind of goes to hell in the handbasket. But it's a very happy handbasket. And in that kind of an environment, all kinds of strange things can happen. Uh, one of them has to do with um, a cargo that the skipjack is carrying, and you know we will just go too far into the weeds if I pursue that. Yeah, let's just let's just leave it there because I think that's enough to entice people without giving too much away. Um, I'll kick it over to Tony and Christopher again. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I really liked about Susan's story was the, the the way that she played on the concept of honor and how it can be used for um, both uh, both purposes in itself and how you can just count on it when you have it in others to and, and it could be used as a sort of a tactical weapon. I don't know if Susan wants to come that into that. Laugh. <laughs> <laughs> well, um I appreciate that, but but yes, it's it's definitely um it's definitely weaponized, I'd say, in the context of this story. Yeah. Well, we should say no more on that, but uh, it's it's yeah. really great, it's, uh, and it's a great twist story too. Yeah, that's why I say it's tough to talk about. Um, let's um, let's go to Homecoming uh, by uh, Robert uh, Butner. Um, I really so this is a story of actually another kind of rundown uh, ship that's on its last legs. Uh, we think. Um, and there's a uh, kind of the main character of this is uh, Patricia, and she's this uh, 11 year old kid that I believe she's 11, who's uh, pr- kind of genius level and precocious and sometimes annoying, um, but a really fun protagonist to have or, or you know, character to follow. Um, where did, you know, you see, you hear Star Destroyers, big ships blowing things up. How do you go to, I have, what about an 11 year old girl? Um, how did that, how did she become a part of this story? I guess is what I'm asking. Well, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to kind of come at that from, by answering the second part first. Uh, sure. Patricia Wynant Riesfeld is the name of the, uh, of the girl you're speaking about. And she is an 11 year old. She is an unaccompanied minor aboard a mile-long warship that's been diverted from its final trip to the staff scrapyard to evacuate 6,000 refugees from a planet that's engulfed in revolution. And separatist revolutionaries hijack the ship, and it falls to her and to a retired in disgrace ship's engineer named John Dahlquist to prevent a disaster. Now, uh, how Patricia came to be was... Uh, that uh, uh, it came out of something that Robert Heinlein, and if you don't know Heinlein, you probably aren't listening to this. I mean, J.R., for example, just alluded to uh, Heinlein's uh, uh, prophetic references to to, uh, the private exploration of space. But anyway, Heinlein uh, wrote that once his characters started talking to one another, he couldn't type fast enough. And I thought, well, what a shame, because some of his best characters never got to talk to each other because they were in different stories. So Homecoming features Patricia Riesfeld, who hates being called Pee-wee, and uh, she's basically the brat from Heinlein's 1958 novel, Have Spacesuit Will Travel. And I wanted to pair Pee-wee with the disgraced ship's engineer, Risling, from Heinlein's 1951 story, The Green the Green Hills of Earth. But Risling had way too much baggage. He was blind, he wrote dirty songs, Heinlein never gave him a first name, and his last name, Risling, sounded confusingly like Riesfeld. So fortunately, Heinlein had created other spacefarers who got crosswise with their superior officers, notably a character named John Dahlquist from Heinlein's 1949 story, The Long Watch. 
and most of the other characters' names are also borrowed from those stories. And uh, <laughs> so th that's kind of that's kind of where I came from there. Uh, I don't know if uh, most readers will will even notice, uh, but uh, I thought it was kind of an entertaining way to do it, and it gave me a chance to see how those characters would interact, which was a lot of fun. Um, I think, uh, interestingly, uh, and I, I think we're going to get to a to another story that that actually uh, that Heinlein did some things like it uh, from Brendan. But uh, anyway, uh, the interesting thing about that was that what I found is I started to cast about for ideas and ended up with this one uh, in trying to come up with something for this story was that uh, Heinlein. Was the if he didn't invent a lot of the uh, a lot of the, the the tropes and memes of science fiction, he certainly was involved with them. And probably giant spaceships, he did less than he did a lot of other things, and that sort of surprised me. Uh, so I don't know. That's a a, a little digression about uh, about Patricia and how she came to be. No, that's great, and I, and I will confess publicly, I didn't catch all of the Heinlein references. Um, I'm going to call out the editors, Tony and Christopher. Did you pick up on that? No, I'll cop to that. <laughs> Tony? I, I think Bob told me. Ah, uh, you cheated. Okay. One of the things I love about the story is the um, is the coda to it, um, which, which this elegiac sort of... Uh, sort of beautiful coda that that puts it all into perspective and and we realize what's been going on with our with our dialogue it's a it's a great um it's a, this this relationship between an old 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 guy and a young uh young girl who's who's destined to be someone like him someday perhaps is uh it's just a a wonderful thing to follow as as you know it's it's in the great tradition of um of of mentor, old mentors passing old wise men passing on their wisdom to the young, much like I did with you, David. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> and, and are, and are trying, trying to do with Christopher, Christopher despite like Christopher's uh, uh, resistance. It's, it's futile, futile Christopher. Christopher. Well, you resisted. <laughs> I got to get I'm not uh, about uh, the spaceship and anyway. <laughs> but it's a be it's a really beautiful story in in the that relationship is the key in the heart of the story of course. And it, and it leads to what the what he does. Mm. Yeah. And uh, um yeah, and David, I think you you had uh you had asked me once before uh uh, talking about this, uh, that uh, about the 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 world that's involved in this in this story and where it came from, and uh, yeah. <clears throat> because uh, uh, as I mentioned before, the, uh, a, a starship uh, gets hijacked by uh, by some uh, some revolutionaries, and uh, that. Is something contemporary uh, that's maybe a little that hits maybe closer to home than we'd like, and so does the fact that there are uh, uh, that there are refugees uh, in 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 wars, and uh, and that they don't end up in the in the best circumstances. And uh, uh, this story, I guess, it's worth pointing out. Somebody said, "Well, what? How do you get to this?" What kind of a universe is this? Well, that's not an easy answer because Homecoming set in the universe that was created in five novels, uh, the Orphanage novels, and then the Orphan's Legacy trilogy, which is uh, from Bain. So that's, you know, it's, it takes eight volumes to tell you how we got to where we are, plus about a half dozen shorts that fill in some gaps in that universe. Uh, but long story short, in that universe, there are 512 habitable planets in the human union. Uh, Wakesel, where these people, where these people are fleeing, is uh, is the coldest and bleakest of those planets. Uh, 
It was named by its first human, modern human visitors for the Wakefillian glaciation that affected Europe for much of human prehistory. In the United States, of course, just like we don't use the metric system, we don't call it that. We call it the Wisconsin glaciation. But uh, the humans, uh, the modern humans, when they got there, found out that, oh, there were already humans who'd been there for 30,000 years. Again, long story, you know, that we can't get into. But uh, And they hadn't made much pro progress since they arrived. And they probably would have left them alone, except that the modern humans also found that in some places on Wakesel, a person could gather a bucket of gem-quality diamonds off the ground in 30 minutes. So Tony was talking about unobtainium. I just, you know, just skip right over the unobtainium part. What's, what the hell are just diamonds there? Um, and that attracted settlers, uh, also missionaries uh, who were bent on uplifting the locals. Uh, the locals, who thought that diamond was good for spear points and not much else, didn't want to be uplifted. They disinvited the settlers. Uh, things got bloody, and the settlers and the missionaries upshuttled, and some of the separatists were smarter than we expected them to be, and they slipped in among them. And then we're at stories off and running. So... That's kind of how that part of it came to be. And I just wonder when you're dealing with, you know, this established universe that you have um, <laughs> established uh, and you're trying to tell a short story for people who maybe aren't familiar with the series. Um, you know, as writers, we like to think everyone's read all of our work, but of course that's not the case. Um, so someone who's coming to this, I think it works very well as a standalone, but how do you wrestle with that, um, doing a standalone story, uh, that at the same time takes place within this bigger framework? That's always an issue when you try to write a short within an existing, uh, uh, especially a large pre-existing universe. You kind of have to create a, uh, a microcosm. Uh, in which the story can exist by itself uh, with, a, with a minimum of all that backstory. Yes, the backstory is boring because it change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think you did it. I think in, um, in this, it works out very well if you're not familiar with it. It's still a, a really touching tale and a really rousing military uh, science fiction story. Um, actually, Christopher, if we could maybe segue perfectly into your story, not made for us because you probably faced some of the same challenges. Yeah. How did you wrestle with that, uh, writing? You've written this 700 page book. Now you're writing a 20 page story, you know? <laughs> um, so I, I'll be the first to admit that I am not a short story writer. I had never written one outside of a class before and um when we started doing this anthology project part of the reason that i was involved at all is they thought it would be a nice educational experience for me since uh tony and tony uh because i am about four years old and uh had been an intern <laughs> and um we're glad to help and yeah <laughs> um yeah, you know, so there was a lot of firsts. You know, this was my first short story. This is my first interview. A, a lot of these short stories we've got were from you know other universes. Uh, we've got Mike's Mike Williamson story was a freehold one. So there's a lot more going on under the surface of these these moments, right? That we're sort of pulling out. And in my case, I just ran as far away from my main narrative as I could, just to you know save. Any any sort of uh, save myself from any sort of entanglements plot wise, um, and to save me time world building, and then have to make up too much new stuff. Um, and, and so it was interesting to try and touch on some of the same themes, but uh, in in much more uh, brief fashion. And, um, and one of the ways I tried to avoid doing, um, 
one of the ways I tried to avoid having a lot of these problems was to write it from the point of view of somebody who does not know anything. Um, and my main character's name is uh, Carax, and Carax is a peasant who has been dragged off of his world. He expected to be a, a farm hand all his life, but money was tight, and uh, if you sign up for the Imperial Legions, you get paid, and in uh, time of war, you probably don't get home to enjoy it so much, so he did it for his family, and he has been thrown into conflict with aliens he did not even know were out there because the uh, the Empire is not so big on telling its peasants uh, what's going on. So he uh, he just assumes he's going to be fighting pirates or some other noble house trying to rebel or the rebellious client state. And surprise, it's the, the first technologically advanced civilization, uh, alien civilization that humankind has encountered in 20,000 years. So... Um, it had a uh, surprise. It had a real, it had a real um, forever war. You know that Joe Haldeman uh, classic, the Forever War oh, um, feel to it. Well, thank you. Did um, was that an influence on you? Have you read that book? And, and uh, I know yeah. of it, but uh, I'll be the first to admit that I have not read as much as I should. Um, you really cool. uh, This is where uh, Christopher, great minds think alike, because uh, just in hearing you synopsize it, I was thinking, yeah, that's kind of what, that that's that's the sort of uh, imagination that Joe brought to that novel, because it was very much the same, uh, uh, a lot of the same uh, themes you just expressed there, so, which I well, intend that okay. as a compliment. Not not as an accusation of plagiarism. <laughs> You've got a lot to answer for, Rocky. No, um, yeah, that's I'm, right. And so does William Shakespeare. Damn it. <laughs> that's true. Hamlet was a rewrite. Yeah, yeah. that's a grammaticus. Yeah. Just to go norm. Yeah, and there's someone in between too, but I forget. Anyway. Um, yeah. Well, one thing I really liked about this, too, is you got this first-person narrator that has this really interesting dialect. I mean, it's it, I know dialect gets a bad rap nowadays. People think there's going to be apostrophes all over the place, which isn't the case. But um, I really, I'm a real sucker for, for voice in a story or in a book. And this had that very strongly. And I just wonder, where did that come from? Like, how did you develop that? Um, style, like you said, he's a very naive narrator. You know, uh, well, he speaks that way for two reasons. Um, the first is that my my novel is also first person, but uh, Hadrian, the main character in that one, is from the the top end of the imperial uh, civilization, and he is very erudite. He's very uh, he's very well read, and he he reference all sorts of things all the time. And so I wanted to do another first person experience but i wanted to run as far away from hadrian as i could so that i wasn't just writing another uh the same character but with a different you know name um and so i wanted him to speak very differently and since he was just a foot soldier i figured he'd be recruited from the imperial serfdom uh and as far as the specifics of how he speaks um, uh, a bit of that is my, my parents, uh, my mother's family is from Fayetteville here in North Carolina, and I won't say to be speaking, you know, a, a proper, you know, rural North Carolina dialect, but it is my poor attempt at sort of approximating, because, you know, a, a, a sort of approximating that kind of way of speaking. And, my brothers will speak that way sometimes for no reason whatsoever because they, my you know my dad's from New York, uh, so I don't know where they got it. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, it's the another great thing about it is the unrelenting nature of uh, of of just the because he's a um, he is a uh, a marine in the classic sense in that he's the fighting man that's coming over from one ship to another. Um, and having to fight his way through some really, some really thick and hairy situations. Yeah, I actually, this was one of those proverbial kept me up stories. Like I read it, um, 
kind of late, you know, I went to bed a little later than I normally do, and I thought, I'll read the first couple pages, and then I'll pick it up, and I read the whole thing. So, it definitely is relentless. It, it really does move, so. Um, well, we need to really move, so let's move on to Brendan's story. Um, I gotta get the table of contents out to make sure I get the title right. A Tale of the Great Trek War aboard the starship persistence uh brendan you close out the anthology so you get that place of honor unfortunately that means you don't get to talk until the end of the podcast so um thanks for sitting tight while we we talked about our stories here um i've read i you, you've written so much i don't want to say i've read quite a bit of your work but i've i've enjoyed following you you've popped up in uh analog here quite a bit lately and this felt like a, a classic brendan um science fiction story to me i really like this one um, this is, I would imagine, a standalone. It's not set in your Dark Victory series for Bane. doesn't seem like it anyways, unless it's, like, Susan, so, so not set in the same world that, you know, that it might as well not be. Um, so this is a, a yeah, yeah. So this is a, a giant generation ship, um, kind of giant beyond our imagination in a way. Um, and there's a conflict going on there as you can imagine maybe people on a generation ship might come into conflict with each other but it's um maybe not the kind of conflict we normally see in these stories uh it's it's pretty explicitly a war and i just wonder if you could set that up and how that works within the within the story sure and again a pleasure to be here um the story is about a generation ship that started off with two crews running it, sort of like a blue and gold crew on a nuclear submarine. And one crew was assigned to port, the other was assigned to starboard. And as the story goes on, you realize that one side are called the Yanks, which whose ancestors were the Americans, and the other ones are called the Hans, whose ancestors were the Chinese, and that it was a joint Chinese-American starship. And somewhere along the way, things went bad, and a war broke out between port and starboard. And every now and then, there's a long-term truce, and the truce breaks down and conflict breaks out. Yeah, and so this is um, a kind of, it's been a semi-cold war for a little bit, and now it's it's heated up. And I really like the um, protagonist of this story. Um, we talked about... Um, in Christopher's story, he he may be naive, but he's definitely a Marine. And we've seen um, other sort of tough-as-nails fighters in Star Destroyers, and, which is great. But this guy is, at least as it start out, he is not tough as a tough-as-nail kind of fighter. Uh, who is he, and, and how does he fit, fit into this world? Sure. He's a, basically a young yeoman whose job it is is to keep records of... Uh, officers meeting and what goes on with the daily um, events of his crew. And as the tale opens up, when war is declared between the two sides, the captain assigns him to record the events of the war so that future generations would know what's going on. He's definitely not a hero, definitely not a tough guy. But because he is sort of befriended by the captain, he goes along on a very serious raid that actually decides the outcome of the war. And the war begins, as most wars do, over scarce resources. And when you have a closed starship that is, you know, traveling great distances over great amounts of time, resources will become scarce. And that's what prompts this war, is there's a technological treasure that each side wants, which I won't tell you what it is, and they fight to the death to take possession of it. One of the things I love about um, this story is the idea that... um, First of all, the ship is so vast that um, that port and starboard can fight each other. <laughs> and the other thing is, is that humans will make uh, identity groups, they'll make nations out of anything. And you're oh, making right. it out of left <laughs> and right. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. and they're going to fight. And, what, of course, what it, because of, and what's funny is I don't mention the story, but one thing I think about is as a starship travels and it's, you know, generations long gen- journey, does America and China even exist as a nation back on Earth? Are they fighting literally over nothing now? This element of the absurd that, that sort of goes through the story that also it, it <laughs> makes it so much fun. It's um, I don't know. There's something there's something 
multi-level in everything Brendan does. I don't know how he does it, but uh, he's one of the great short story writers of, of our time, I think. Yeah, I've I've really and, and you know it's another one of those that we don't want to talk about too much, unfortunately. Um, but one thing I did like that you see a little bit um, is I like kind of there is this sort of combination of high tech and low tech. Um, at one point, the the main character talks about a paper ration, um, and uh, obviously something towards the end uh, happens that kind of plays into that. And then you also have this bit with the um, some of the tech malfunctioning and, uh, I don't know. There was something ap- appealing about that in a way to be interesting. Um, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to say about that. It's sort of like our own earth. I mean, we have societies where you can grab a handheld device and instantly be connected with every piece of knowledge ever, you know, gathered by man. And you go on a plane trip and end up in some desolate village somewhere where they're still living, you know, a Stone Age life in this technologically advanced society. And again, you know, a starship being a closed environment, basically what you have is what you have along the line. You know, entropy kicks in, things start falling apart, and you can have a starship where you have hundreds of, you know, colonists in deep freeze or suspended animation. And on the other hand, you have pigs and goats going down passageways, and you have paper being rationed. It's just, you know, that weird dichotomy, which I had a lot of fun playing with, as you can probably tell. Um, I guess one last thing. You are you kind of, I think it's fair to say, are more known for your crime writing, mystery writing, um, although you've been making quite a, quite some inroads into science fiction lately. Um, how, what are some of the differences and maybe the, the pleasures of writing one, one over the other um, or are, or is, do you approach them the same way when you write, sit down to write a crime story or a science fiction story? Well, I think with a crime story or a suspense or thrill story, it's, you know, almost always contemporary, though sometimes they've written about stuff in the past. And it's fun, you know, exploring why people do to each other what they want to do. But when I go to science fiction, um, it's like the little 12-year-old boy in me wakes up who read Heinlein, <laughs> Asimov, and Bradbury in the 60s and 70s. And you try to inject that sort of, you know, for lack of a better term, that sense of wonder, that sense of newness, um, you know, the promise of new ideas and vistas that science fiction has always promised. So I go with science fiction, which I think a little bit more enthusiasm and joy of playing something that um, I was really into when I was growing up. Okay, well, um, I think that's about an hour. Yeah, it's about an hour's worth. So um, does anyone, Tony or Christopher, do you want to wrap up? Um, do you have anything you wanted to add uh, or any of the contributors, if you guys and gals want to uh, say anything, uh, speak now. Well, I know it's getting good reviews from Publishers Weekly and Booklist, which is great that they're acknowledging it. So it's a wonderful anthology. Grab it. Some great stories in there. Thanks for having us on the, on the radio yeah. show. Yeah, absolutely. I am... Um, yeah, I'll wrap up. I'll just say it's been great talking to everybody. Um, J.R. Dunn, Joel Presby, Susan R. Matthews, uh, Robert Butner, Christopher Rocchio, uh, Brendan Du Bois, and our man behind the microphone, usually, Mr. Tony Daniel. Uh, the book is Star Destroyers, and it's out now in trade paperback. So thanks, everybody, for taking the time out of your day to talk about the book. And uh, was had a great time talking with everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. And and thank you all for the story. This is another entry in Alliance of Equals, a Leaden Universe novel by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Beset by the angry remnants of the Department of the Interior, and challenged at every turn by opportunists on their new homeworld of Sherbleek, and low on funds, Clan Corval desperately needs to reestablish its position as one of the top trading clans in known space. To this end, master trader Sean Yosgalen and Corval's premier trade ship, Dutiful Passage, is on a mission to establish new business associations and to build a strong primary route that links well with existing loops and secondary routes. 
but re-establishing trade and preserving the lives of the few remaining members of the clan aren't all of Corval's problem. Matters come to a head as Dutiful Passage, accustomed to being welcomed and feeded at those ports on its call list, finds itself denied docking and blacklisting while agents of the DOI mount an armed attacks on others of Corval's traders under the very eyes of port security systems. Traveling with dutiful trader on this unsettling journey is Patty O'Scalen, the master trader's heir and his apprentice. Patty is eager to make up for time lost due to Corval's unpleasantness with the Department of the Interior, but she is also keeping a secret so intense that her coming of age and perhaps her very life is threatened by it. And here is the latest entry in Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Alliance of Equals. The customs ship had released its camera drones, three, and continued its own inspection until they returned, having recorded the passage by thirds. Transmission, said Pilot Jorick. We're cleared. Report sent to Langlast Portmaster. Copy to us under cover of this communication. Jorick looked to Priscilla, who had remained on the bridge during these events states there will be a recheck. Dilnem gave an unliaden snort. Do they expect us to receive contraband in orbit? It might happen, Priscilla said, though I wonder how we would conceal the pods. Heard there's a field, Jorick said. Pirates, serious pirates, use it. Disrupts scan and visual. Any new pods we took on would be invisible. Close enough. Thus the cameras and the magnetometers, said Dilnem with a sigh. Well, perhaps that is reason enough for such prudence. How common are these devices? Jorick shrugged. Wouldn't think they were as common as all that. I don't know that I actually believe the thing even exists. Wouldn't have to be a pirate to want one either. Plenty of small shippers and gray traders would welcome a way to dodge a little bit of excise. Well, Priscilla said, coming out of the captain's chair and stretching tight muscles. Leave a note for the next team to expect the customs boat at intervals, to log it and record their procedure with a copy to my screen. Yes, Captain, Jorick said. Done. Thank you. I'll be in my office if there's need. So I danced it all into a stone closet at the very heart of myself, she said, her voice dull. Most of the tale had poured forth, as ungoverned as her weeping. That passion was spent now. She was exhausted, poor child, and the headache was back, which was worrisome for more than the usual reasons. He'd blocked the damn thing three times now, and he was not the most unskilled healer the hall had ever trained. Yet here it was again, edgier and angrier than before. And he, he had to be very careful indeed here. Gently, he extended a line of comfort to the shame-filled child beside him and gently spoke her name. Paddy. Father, forgive me for being afraid. I forgive you freely. In the interest of balance, I will, of course, ask that you forgive me for being afraid. In fact, I believe we had best do the thing properly if we're to do it at all, and forgive the Delm for being afraid, Aunt Nova and Cousin Kareen. Patrin was certainly afraid. He confessed as much to me. To my observation, Lucan is not a fool. Therefore, he must also have been afraid. Paddy had raised her head and was watching him from eyes squinted half shut with pain. Aunt Anthora? she asked. Never tell me she was afraid. I must do so, however. She was very nearly caught and killed, you know, by a device created specifically to entrap and harm those of the Dramleys. 
The next time you are home, ask her for the round tail. He crossed his legs, looking out over the darkening landscape. Let us see, who else must we add to our list? Why, you as much as told me that Quinn was afraid. I expect we shall have to forgive him, and also Priscilla, and Uncle Renzel. Uncle Valcon? Paddy asked suddenly. You said the Delm. Sean sighed and extended a careful hand to cover hers where it was fisted on her knee. I wager that Uncle Valcon was more afraid even than I was. And I do not mind telling you, speaking as we are among kin, that I was terrified. She swallowed hard. Also, she whispered, I lied to you. Yes, you did. He squeezed her hand gently. It grieves me that you felt you must. I am desolate that I must have given you the impression that I would refuse to assist you with the arrival of your gift. However, surely Priscilla is everything that is discreet and trustworthy. Might you not have gone to her? No. She took a breath and managed somewhat to moderate herself. No, you never, father, you never. But we were at the rock, and there were enemies, and I didn't need it. I needed, I needed to be strong, and not afraid, and not distracted, and I locked it away with the fear. He nodded seriously. I quite see that. You stood, after all, in the front line of defense. You needed your wits about you. But once you had been retrieved from the rock and enclosed by the clan's protections, couldn't you have spoken then? Paddy shook her head. It was gone. If I thought about it at all, which I cannot say that I did, then I would have recalled that the fear and, and my talent were tied together. Another breath, followed by a whisper. And I didn't want to be known for a coward, father. A pilot of Corval is not a coward. Her face was averted. He squeezed her hand again and released it, settling carefully back into his chair. That supposition is worthy of further study, he said. I will look out the diary references for you. In the meantime, my child, I suggest that we take a small break to shower and refresh ourselves and meet back here in an hour. Does that align with your schedule? Paddy smiled faintly, but with good intent. Yes, father. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, to David F. Sharrod, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a deep and humble bow of gratitudinous fealty and a heaping helping of praise and plaudits to Robert Butner, Joel Presby, J.R. Dunn, Susan R. Matthews, and Brendan Dubois, and Christopher Rocchio, who is the editor along with me, Tony Daniel, of the great new anthology about big ships blowing things up. Star Destroyers. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. Stars.